Claudia's uh, uh, talk today, possibly elsewhere in this uh, uh, school. And then in the second half of the second half, I'll get to uh, the more recent dual topological insulator that we studied uh, more recently. So um, we've seen in the first part this uh, um, related uh, real space uh, uh, um, analog of uh, whale semi-metal. And now we'll speak about uh, actual electronic momentum space whale semi-metal. So we probably heard different uh, ways in which it was introduced already in this school. I'll give you uh, a brief reminder. Uh, so in a whale semi-metal, we get two interpenetrating uh, bands, which form this uh, nodal line. Then in the presence of various uh, perturbation, like spin orbit coupling, this may gap out. And in some cases, it will gap out, leaving behind uh, a degeneracy point. These degeneracy points are the whale nodes in the bulk of this material. Around them, we have linear dispersion and uh, berry flux, uh, berry curvature that goes from a uh, source and into the uh, drain, which means that if we introduce now, uh, if we quantize the a single uh, momentum axis and think of this two-dimensional electron gas in momentum space, whenever it's outside the region uh, enclosed by these two whale nodes, zero berry uh, flux is threading it. However, if we now tune this quantized momentum uh, in between these two uh, uh, whale nodes, uh, uh, quantized, Berry flux threads it, and basically what we have here is a, a two-dimensional quantum Hall state, which means that when we introduce a termination, a, bear, a, a boundary, we will get a, an edge mode, a chiral edge mode. Now, if we continue to tune this uh, quantized momentum, we collect these uh, edge modes one by one, which together form a two-dimensional electron gas on the surface, connecting the two. Uh, while nodes or the surface projection of the two bulk while nodes and these are the Fermi arcs that we expect to find on the surface of the material. Now if we think of it uh, semi-classically, uh, sorry before that as we've seen before, as we said before even in the case of the real space analog, uh, what a whale semi or the bulk, topological bulk of a whale semi-metal does is basically send one half of the uh, surface band to the other side of the material uh, you cannot relieve this with any local uh, perturbation, uh, uh, but this is not the end of the story. If you now apply a weak magnetic field, then semi-classically, the electron will start to travel along this open contour band until it will get stuck at the end of it. Uh, the bulk states will be the ones that will channel it all the way down to the other facet of the material. Uh, um, and, and where it will traverse the bottom Fermi arc and go back up to the uh, top surface. And with this, uh, complete its uh, uh, travel. And Adolfo discussed this uh, theoretically quite uh, uh, um, in detail. Uh, so this is the, the uh, uh, theoretical picture that we have, the simplistic theoretical picture that we have of a wild semi-metal. In reality, uh, it's a bit more complicated. So as was shown before, Tantalum arsenide has uh, 24 wild nodes in its bulk. When projected to the 0, 0, 1 surface, we're left with 16 uh, wild nodes or eight pairs of wild nodes. Um, and this is, even this is not the end of the story. On top of these wild nodes, so all these wild nodes will be connected by Fermi arcs on the surface. On top of that, we have also trivial states that reside on the surface of this material. So we have a very, Oops, very rich uh, surface band structure. And one of our goals, and there are several uh, uh, complementary STM works that were done on this material, really the challenge was to uh, distinguish between the topological bands and the trivial one, and on the way, learn uh, uh, and study the new unique properties of the Fermi arcs and how they are different from the trivial bands in this material. As was shown before, uh, the Fermi arcs are visualized quite nicely with the ARPES, so we would definitely want to go with STM beyond just visualizing them again in STM, but say something about their properties. So, uh, scanning tiny microscopy, again, we bring a sharp metallic tip to the surface of the sample. This is a topographic image 
of a tantalum arsenide cleaved uh, surface. This is the atomically resolved uh, surface. And what we would like to do uh, next in STM is to let the electrons scatter from the various impurities that we have on the surface. This is uh, an interfere uh, with one another. This is how it looks like on the 111 surface of copper again. This is a carbon monoxide molecule which scattered the electron and gives rise to the circular uh, uh, ripples uh, in the density of states on the surface. And they indeed carry the wavelength of the electrons. By doing it at different energies, we can say something about both the dispersion and the scattering processes that uh, take place uh, on the surface. And this is how it looks like uh, when we study it, when we measured now the local density of state distribution on the surface of tantalum arsenic. And what you should see here is these elongated elliptical paddles with some inner structure uh, uh, around them, around each impurity that we had before. And these impurities are arsenic vacancies uh, uh, on the uh, top surface of the material. So in order to uh, figure out what are the wavelengths that are involved in this interference pattern, we do a Fourier transform analysis, which reveals a very beautiful, well-ordered structure in a reciprocal space or in momentum transfer space. In order to understand where is the physics hiding in this uh, structure, we need to go back to the calculated band structure or the one measured by ARPES in order to figure out what are all the possible scattering processes that may take place within this uh, uh, band structure, uh, surface band structure of the material. This is a good point to note that this surface band structure was uh, uh, fully fitted to ARPES measurement before we uh, uh, got to use it by, by Bingai, which means that we had no uh, free parameters to play with uh, apart for the, uh, a bit, uh, the Fermi energy. So uh, all the fittings that we did relied uh, uh, on the pre-existing uh, uh, band structure calculations. And then what we do is pick the scattering processes one by one. So we may have scattering processes within the, this ellipse-like band, which uh, uh, look like this. Here is the calculated uh, uh, scattering uh, uh, pattern that we expect to get. We can have scattering between the ellipse-like and bowtie band. Uh, uh, like we uh, uh, call it. We can have scattering within the bow tie bands and uh, we can have scattering in between Fermi arcs, within the different Fermi arcs and between Fermi arcs and trivial bands. So uh, many different kinds of scattering and you can already see that we can indeed identify this ellipse as a scattering within the ellipse-like band, this uh, somewhat vague bow tie feature that we'll address later as the scattering within the bow tie band. These uh, squares at the corners are scattering between ellipse and bow tie. And already if we zoom in into the zone center, we can identify the first scattering signature coming from Fermi arcs. It is, it is these uh, leaf-like structures that extend beyond uh, uh, the central ellipse and cannot be explained but as scattering between uh, this one between the uh, gamma Y Fermi arc and this trivial uh, segment that uh, leads uh, to it in the band structure. So one naive thing we can do is just Fourier transform this interference pattern. And this is, and now we do a one dimensional Fourier transform along this real space axis and find this interference pattern. And this is how it's related to the two dimensional scattering picture we got before from the uh, point impurities. So immediately we see that this uh, triangularly dispersing band is coming from this ellipse band that we identified before. And these diagonal lines are coming from these squares at the corners that were scattering between uh, ellipse and bow tie. So this is how they disperse. And we can compare it to the calculated uh, uh, scattering uh, patterns, this time as a function of energy along this uh, uh, cut. Now, uh, we can do a slightly more uh, careful analysis. If I zoom in into this modulated density of states, you see that it has this non-dispersing stripe of uh, uh, blue is high density of states, red is low density of states. And I overlay here the tropographic profile, which is measured simultaneously. So you immediately find that whenever the tip is tunneling into an arsenic site, we get a high density of states 
and we never it tunnels into a tantalum site, we get a low density of states, and really the, the uh, a terminating uh, atom uh, is, is reflected in this uh, modulated density of states. So what I'll do next is uh, do a slightly more careful Fourier transform analysis. So what we do is first hide all the tantalum positions in the crystal and Fourier transform just the interference pattern that comes from the arsenic site. And this is how it looks like. So we identify again this uh, triangularly dispersing band. Uh, this band comes again from the uh, uh, ellipse band. It's a trivial band. We know that this band comes from all the arsenic dangling bonds that we have on the surface. And this is why we indeed identified on the arsenic atoms on the topmost surface. Now we go half a unit cell uh, sideways, uh, expose the tantalum site, and do a Fourier transform and get a completely different uh, dispersing behavior. We uh, compare it to the uh, calculated scattering behavior that comes solely from scattering within the Fermi arc in this material and find very nice agreement. So this shows you that the uh, uh, trivial bands and the topological bands reside on different atomic sites in this material on the surface. The fact that the um, uh, tantalum, sorry, the fact that the uh, Fermi arcs reside predominantly on the tantalum sites is not surprising because we know that the whale cones in the, uh, uh, in the bulk of the material are mainly derived from tantalum orbitals. And this is why the Fermi arcs, which they induce, also reside on these uh, um, sites. And on top of that, unlike these uh, dangling bond bands, which are tightly localized to the topmost arsenic surface, because they are there due to uh, the local surface potential induced by these dangling bonds, the uh, Fermi arc bands reside deeper in the uh, lattice. They are not there because of the surface potential. They are there because of the topological uh, aspects, because of the bulk uh, whale nodes. And we indeed find them deeper, one layer deeper, residing on the uh, tantalum sites. And here uh, I show the uh, um, wave function distribution of these two bands uh, on the surface, where indeed you see that the ellipse band is tightly localized on the terminating arsenic layer, the uh, Fermi arc bands reside in between and penetrate much deeper into the bulk. So this indeed shows that uh, uh, the trivial band and the topological bands have uh, already a different character uh, in this respect. And now let me go back again, zoom out to this uh, two-dimensional scattering pattern that I showed you before and show you that we can learn one more thing about the, uh, uh, the uh, um, insusceptibility of the uh, Fermi arc bands to this uh, terminating uh, arsenic layer and to uh, generally the details of the uh, uh, crystallographic termination. So once, one thing that uh, bothered us or surprised us in this scattering behavior was the different replications that we found of the different uh, uh, scattering uh, processes. With this, I mean the fact that the bow tie, as I told you, appears very uh, vaguely around the center, but very strongly around Bragg peaks. On the other hand, the ellipse band appears strong both in the center and around Bragg peaks. So uh, this, sorry, let me wait with that. This means that uh, um, there is some scattering process which is very sensitive uh, to the uh, type of band, very anisotropic. It is very highly uh, energy dependent. So this doesn't seem to come from the uh, scattering potential. It is, it is a bit too detailed to come just from the scatterer itself and seems to come for all these replications seem to come from the actual wave function of the uh, uh, electrons. What really convinced us that this is the case was actually what we found away from uh, uh, this QPI patterns that comes again from scattering from point impurities. So we went to regions where we have no scatterers, no arsenic vacancies, and still we found that the density of states is modulated. This is these stripes that you see here. And then if we did the same measurement but at a different energy, we saw that this modulation changed its uh, uh, direction. 
So there is some uh, um, energy dependence, some dispersion to the uh, wave function structure in this material, and this is what we wanted to understand better. And it doesn't come from uh, uh, the impurities, it actually comes from the wave function itself of the different bands. And, and there's a, a, a joint, a single mechanism, this is what I'll show you next, that controls both these uh, behaviors. So, so far, uh, we considered only the, uh, a single brilliant zone of the material. However, uh, and looked, of course, at the density of state, and that's the general formula for the, uh, calculating the density of states. However, we know that whenever we have electrons in the periodic potential, it gives rise to a full Bloch structure of the wave function and multiple brilliant zones. So what we actually need to do is to plug into this wave function the full Bloch expansion of the different uh, uh, wave function, which means that uh, every, Bloch, uh, uh, every Bloch component comes with this uh, coefficient, which is not a random number on one hand. It's not a, a, a equal one up to infinity. It's actually part of the band structure of the material. So when you tell me that uh, uh, I study tantalum arsenide, you don't just give me the band structure in the first brilliant zone. You also, uh, with it, determine these coefficients of the whole Bloch uh, uh, um, uh, expansion of this uh, uh, material. So this is indeed part of the band structure of tantalum arsenide. And now what, what happens is that whenever we have more than a single a dominant coefficient, um, and this is highlighted with a, a darker red in this uh, illustration, we indeed can get, uh, uh, so if we now plug this into the um, uh, density of states, we indeed find that whenever we have more than a single dominant uh, a Bloch coefficient separated by some reciprocal wave vector uh, uh, small g, we would get a modulated local density of states regardless of scatterers. This is just comes from the Bloch structure of the wave function. Uh, at the same time, this uh, two dominant uh, Bloch coefficient would give rise to replications of the uh, scattering signatures we can, because the electrons can both scatter within the uh, uh, brilliant zone and also between different brilliant zones. Question? Because this material doesn't have uh, the, the, the way the bonds go uh, change. What? Oh. Oh, you mean because of the colors? No, th this is just schematic. It's just random. Just to illustrate, uh, you're right. Uh, it should have a C2 symmetry. It would have in a minute. Sorry. Um, so both the real space modulation in a vacancy-free region and the replication of the quasi-particle interference uh, patterns that we find are, should be governed by the Bloch structure of the material. So now let's go back to the uh, brilliant zone, the calculate, the, sorry, the measured quasi-particle interference pattern. And what we did was to go back to, to Binga and uh, ask him if he can actually calculate the Bloch structure of the different bands in tantalum arsenide. And he said, yes, so this is something you can calculate and predict also in materials. And this is how, uh, what he sent us for the uh, Bloch structure of the ellipse band. Now it indeed has a C2 symmetry. Um, and indeed, you see that there is more than a single dominant uh, um, Bloch coefficient for the ellipse band. So now what we can do now is collect all the uh, scattering patterns that we found in the experiment one by one based, by, based on the uh, calculated uh, Bloch structure. So the strongest would be this scattering between this edge of the brilliant zone and that one, because that's the most dominant Bloch coefficient. And this should be the strongest uh, uh, pattern that we see. Then we get scattering between this half of the ellipse and that half of the ellipse, the uh, slightly less dominant. Only then uh, we will see the scattering, I mean, in intensity. Only then, uh, weaker in intensity, we expect to see scattering between the outer half of the ellipse and the other outer half of the ellipse. And indeed, in the experiment, we see this ellipse being uh, half strong and half weak. This reflects exactly this block structure structure 
of the ellipse band. And finally, we can identify a very faint signature of this scattering uh, uh, process between these two brilliant zones. So by this, we've collected all the scattering patterns that we indeed found uh, uh, for the ellipse band. Now what about the um, uh, Fermi arc band? So this is how the block structure of the Fermi arc band looks like. Very simple. Uh, it actually has a single dominant Bloch coefficient, but this, uh, which means, first of all, that we don't expect to see Fermi arc signature uh, uh, around any Bragg peak. It will be located only uh, at small queues around the center of the brilliant zone, but this sends a very important message. Uh, this Bloch structure comes from the uh, periodicity of the crystal. Having a single Bloch coefficient means that the wave function of the Fermi arcs is very much plane wave-like, which means that the Fermi arcs, are like, unlike the trivial bands, don't feel really the uh, underlying periodicity of the crystal. They are hardly affected by it, and this is why we get a single dominant coefficient, a plane wave-like behavior for the Fermi arcs. So now this allowed us to do uh, one last trick, uh, which we called uh, um, like Bloch-based arithmetics. So now that we know that whether there, there shouldn't be any contribution of the Fermi arcs around these uh, Bragg peaks, we can try and subtract the uh, ellipse contribution that we measure here from its contribution in the center and see, look, if anything is hiding behind this uh, central ellipse. So when we do that, this is what we find. So the ellipse band is almost completely eliminated by uh, this subtraction. The uh, Fermi arc signature was hardly affected by this subtraction, again, because there is no Fermi arc contribution around the Bragg peaks, so this subtraction did not change this leaf-like structure. But then what we do find is this curly feature that were uh, uh, drowned somewhere behind this strong ellipse band, and if we compare this to the uh, calculated uh, scattering processes, again, based on a, a DFT calculation that was fully fitted beforehand to ARPES, there was no uh, uh, playing with the uh, parameters in this case, we identify the scattering processes, and these are the scattering processes coming from the other Fermi arc along the gamma X band, and they're scattering into these high intensity points that happen to be on the surface of this material, and this is why these signatures are much sharper than these signatures that scatter into this extended uh, trivial part of the uh, surface band structure. So uh, with this, we kind of uh, 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 firmly concluded that indeed the Fermi arcs are not replicated to higher uh, uh, Bragg peaks. They really behave as a, a, a plane wave, uh, uh, have a plane wave behavior uh, which is uh, very different than the uh, behavior of all other trivial bands that we find on the surface. Um, and, of course, uh, the, the structure of the Bloch wave function should contribute to other measurement whenever interference plays a role uh, or whenever the uh, um, uh, imaging of the uh, uh, wave function uh, is possible, like in ARPES, and indeed you, f you, you see that all the ellipse and bow tie bands appear to be half strong, half weak. The intensity is not uniform. So many other processes should be uh, affected by the Bloch structure as much as uh, STM and QPI measurements do. So these were our observation of uh, uh, the Fermi arcs and their unique properties in tantalum arsenide. And now I will uh, switch gears and move to the uh, last part of, of my, my talk and I guess of the whole school. Um, perfect. So uh, at the end, I would like to discuss our recent measurement of uh, a new material uh, with uh, bismuth to tellurium iodine, which initially was predicted to be a weak TI. Later, it was predicted to be also a crystalline topological insulator. And uh, what we find is that it, it's indeed both of them. Uh, and this is uh, what we found on this material. So this is the uh, crystal structure of uh, BTI, uh, as I'll call it uh, uh, to be uh, shorter. Um, it's made of layers of the trivial semiconductor bismuth-1, telluride-1 iodine, uh, 
and interleaved with uh, bilayers of bismuth. Now, bilayers of bismuth is a very unique uh, two-dimensional material because it was already shown uh, before, uh, uh, predicted by Murakami first and show, shown by Drozdov from uh, Ali Asdani's group that uh, bismuth bilayers are uh, two-dimensional topological insulators. So uh, by stacking this uh, uh, unit cell, we uh, get uh, stacks of two-dimensional topological insulators which indeed should be a weak topological insulator. This is the prescription to obtain a weak topological insulator. So this is how the bulk uh, band structure looks like or the interesting bands in the bulk band structure. So what we have because of this uh, layering of the uh, bismuth bilayers interleaved within the uh, uh, BTI uh, trivial semiconductor is two inverted bands uh, located both at the gamma and the Z high symmetry point of the band structure. What happens when we project this band structure to the uh, side facet is we obtain indeed two uh, copies of the, these Dirac cones, uh, of these inverted uh, bands on the gamma tilde and Z tilde locations of the side surfaces of this material. So this is uh, um, perpendicular to the layering, to the stacking uh, direction. Now this material in addition has uh, a mirror, three mirror symmetry planes. And this affects the top surfaces and bottom surfaces of this, mater this material. So if we project to the top surface, what we first find, uh, if we don't include further perturbations, is these two interpenetrating uh, Dirac bands on this surface. However, in the generally in the presence of perturbations, these, uh, this node align will gap out and leave us with an insulating top and bottom surfaces. This would be a normal three-dimensional topological insulators. Metallic on the side surfaces and insulating on the top and bottom surfaces. However, the mirror, uh, three mirror planes in this material will prevent, will protect the gapping out of this degeneracy line at six uh, high symmetry uh, uh, points uh, within the brilliant zone, which would leave us with six Dirac cones residing on the top surface. This is the uh, surface states of uh, its uh, uh, topological crystalline insulator nature, and simultaneously side surface states of a weak topological insulator. So basically, what we uh, were after in this material was uh, uh, the coexistence the mutual existence of this surface crystalline topological insulator and, and a side uh, a weak TI surface state. And mainly what happens on the corners, on the edges, where these two meet and can maybe hybridize or interact. And this is what captured by this image. This is the overlay of the uh, TCI states with the two DTI states uh, uh, on, that happens really on the edges of this material. Now, dual topological insulator is a, a topic that gained uh, uh, some attention uh, recently, and actually uh, uh, quite a few of the speakers in this uh, conference looked at these uh, uh, aspects. Uh, more recently, uh, some other speakers from this uh, conference also kind of took it one step further, looking at higher order topological insulators, uh, which can also be realized in uh, bismuth to uh, tellurium iodine. However, these require, uh, seem to require, as far as we understand it, uh, additional perturbation, like uh, uh, time reversal symmetry breaking of these side surfaces. But uh, generally, this uh, combination of different topological uh, classification within a single material seems to be a very interesting new avenue. And you can only think about the combinatorical possible growth of topological phases if we now start to pair different top known topological phases into such dual uh, uh, topological materials. So this is what we wanted to study. Let me now show you what we actually found. So when we cleave this material, we get this uh, very complicated staircase structure, uh, quite disordered, which uh, we use to our advantage in order to see what this order does to these different states we can immediately identify the uh, different surface terminations 
of this material by comparing it to the band structure, sorry, to the uh, crystal structure. So all these white gaps are van der Waals layers between the different uh, uh, um, uh, units of this uh, uh, layer. And you see that actually what we exposed here is all possible terminations that we can find in this material. So we have three bismuth bilayer termination and one tellurium termination and one iodine termination. So we can study all possible termination that uh, may happen in this material. So the first thing we did was just to uh, measure a spectroscopic line cut that runs all across this top surface of the material, all over the different uh, top terminations. And this is how the local density of state versus energy and position looks like. At the first glance, it looks quite complicated. So let me guide you through uh, the important features that uh, we could extract from this uh, line cut. So first of all, uh, um, it is all it, it, on the terraces, on every terrace, it is non-metallic. So this is uh, the local density of state that we measure. At the bottom, it's zero density of states. Uh, on all surfaces, we find a metallic behavior. This is how a single uh, point spectrum looks like. That's the blue line, uh, the, uh, the IDV versus energy. And in gray, I plotted the calculated density of states. The uh, solid gray is how it looks like when you calculate it for the bulk. So the bulk is insulating, still insulating. This is why we have a, a semiconducting gap of about 160 milli electron volts. However, indeed, when you calculate the surface uh, projection of this uh, topological bulk, you find a strictly metallic behavior because of the existence of the two-dimensional topological crystalline insulator surface states. So this is uh, a first possibility, if you want, that this metallic behavior that we find everywhere on the surface comes from the TCI surface states. Of course, they do not uh, uh, care what is the exact surface termination because they are there because of the uh, bulk classification. So they should appear on every surface termination, whether it's bismuth, iodine, or tellurium, which indeed what happens. Next, when we go uh, to the, uh, uh, right next to the steppages in this material, we find this uh, suppression in the local density of states. These are these uh, white, uh, uh, blue patch patches that we find next to steppages. And here I plot uh, two spectra, one taken right at the steppage, that's the blue line, and one taken slightly away from it, somewhere in the middle of the terrace. And you can indeed see that the main difference is this suppression in the local density of states that we find on, next to steppages in this in-gap states that we said can possibly come from the TCI states. Now, of course, these steppages, what they do for the TCI states, surface states, is break the mirror symmetry. Uh, by breaking the mirror symmetry, they uh, gap at least part of the six Dirac cones that reside on the surface, which indeed should give rise to a suppression in the local density of states next to these steppages. And one uh, last interesting uh, uh, observation is that if you look uh, one by one, you find that the suppression always occurs, uh, predominantly at least, on the upper side, uh, upper terrace of the steppage and is hardly, if at all, detected on the lower side of the terrace. We believe that the reason for that is that the uh, situation, the uh, um, setup that the electrons, this surface uh, TCI electrons see when they reside on, on the uh, upper terrace is very different than what they see on the lower terrace. On the upper terrace, they terminate in, into vacuum. So the wave function has to terminate abruptly. That's the strongest possible uh, perturbation, the strongest possible mirror symmetry breaking. On the other hand, these TCI states that uh, reside one layer below uh, don't see that much of a change. One layer above them, it's true, a, a, an additional layer is added, but it's not such a strong perturbation. And we believe this is the origin for the strong asymmetry that we see in the gapping of the surface TCI states. So this is the three properties that we could identify for these metallic surface states. They seems to identify them as TCI surface states because 
Uh, trivial surface states are, first of all, uh, surface speci specific. They always depend on the uh, local uh, um, uh, energetics of the surface. Usually, they don't appear uh, in van der Waals cleaved layers because there are no dangling bonds. There is no strong uh, energetics there. And uh, they are not susceptible to mirror breaking uh, 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 perturbations. You, we, uh, we never see a, a gapping out of trivial surface states next to step edges. So this is the uh, TCI part of the material. Now, what we did next was to go right to the uh, step edges of the uh, different terminations and see if we can find the um, other aspect of this dual topological insulator coming from its weak TI uh, nature that actually reside, should reside on some of these side surfaces. So we first go to the uh, um, look at these step edges that terminate at the bismuth bilayer because as I told you, the bismuth bilayer is the topological element that when you layer it, uh, give rise to the weak TI. So a step edge that contains a bismuth bilayer should in principle be a two-dimensional, uh, an edge of a two-dimensional topological insulator. If a step edge does not contain a bismuth bilayer, it is not an edge of a two-dimensional topological insulator. So there should be a difference between the edges of a, a bismuth bilayer containing uh, uh, stacks and those that do, don't contain it. So we look at this uh, uh, step edge, and this is the spectrum that we find right on the edge. And in dotted line, I show you the spectrum that we find in the bulk of uh, every uh, terrace next to it. And you can, I hope, see that we get an uh, added density of states right on the step edge of this bismuth bilayer termination. We go to the other uh, bismuth termination, and again, we see this added in-gap density of states. Well, it's not in-gap because in the background, when we go away from the step edge, we we'll still have the contribution from the metallic uh, TCI surface states. But on top of them, we get an additional density of states. Both of them happen at the same energy of minus 100 milli electron volts. When we then go to uh, trivial uh, terminations, in between, we do not identify this additional density of states. So we can conclude that this uh, uh, edge modes that uh, presumably live on these step edges know exactly if, if the layer below them contains a bismuth bilayer or doesn't. When it does, uh, 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 an edge mode is induced. When it doesn't, we, don't detect, we never detected such a, a, an addition. Let me show you the imaging of this, uh, uh, special imaging of these modes. So this is uh, one imaging that we have. This is an edge mode that runs uh, uh, along a segment uh, somewhere along this step edge, uh, taken at the, sorry, this should be minus 100 uh, milli electron volt. So this is the special, special distribution of this resonance running right along uh, uh, the step edge. What was interesting was when we went to a more disordered uh, step edge, like the one I show here, uh, we uh, still find uh, in some position this added density of states, but it becomes very position dependent. So let me show you the distribution of the, uh, this edge channel uh, 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 on this surface. So this is the wave function distribution of this uh, resonance at minus 100 milli electron volts. You can see that in some region it really follows the step edge, but then it gets fragmented and kind of uh, we lose it and it diffuses into the, um, into the terrace. We lose its visibility. So what we uh, 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 speculate, I mean, if, if this would be a topological state, of course it should be resilient to disorder. Now this uh, edge mode is actually facing a different uh, uh, situation because on, the, on these step edges, we have both the uh, helical modes that run along the edge mode. And in parallel, we have the two-dimensional TCI states that reside on all, all over the uh, top surfaces. This allows the possibility of the uh, uh, edge mode to scatter into the TCI surface states, very much like uh, happens in a whale semi-metal, in the bulk of a whale semi-metal, where the topological protection 
is, is given only as long as you don't allow scattering between the two wild cones. In the same sense, the topological protection of this two-dimensional uh, helical edge mode is provided as long as they do not scatter into the other available surface uh, states, the TCI states, that also reside on the surfaces. And it seems that once the disorder content becomes strong enough, they indeed lose their protection. So in that sense, the dual topological insulator has both uh, properties, but on the edge, right on the edge, when both of them coexist, this may lead to uh, a reduced protection uh, of the edge mode that resides on the step edges. So um, these were our observation on this dual topological insulator. Let me just thank uh, the people that uh, uh, directly contributed to the uh, different measurement I presented to you. This is uh, uh, students uh, and staff in, in my lab. DFT calculation were uh, done by uh, Bing Hai and his student Yan Soon and, and uh, his students still in Dresden. Bing Hai is now at the Weizmann Institute. Uh, theory uh, uh, we uh, uh, conceived together with Adi Stern and the samples, uh, both the tantalum arsenide and the uh, bismuth 2 tellurium iodine were uh, uh, given uh, from Claudia Felser group for, in Max Planck Institute. So thank you very much.